I'm big on being a capitalist. I'm not ashamed of it. I tell people all the time, if you're going to, you know, and become an investor, you are a capitalist. There's nothing wrong with that. But who's to say that you can't turn around and create scholarships or give money to churches or create your own foundation and do whatever you want to do with the money that you've made? There's nothing wrong with it because we have a lot of guilt on us as investors. And I'm pretty sure you understand. Welcome back to the Purpose of Money podcast. Today, I'm super excited. We are going to talk about how realtors can leverage real estate to boost their income and revenue. We're joined today by Candle Lockett. Candle is a real estate investor, rehabber, and real estate consultant who helps beginners build wealth and create passive income through the power of real estate. Yes, her name is Candle. That's the one her mama gave her. And she is from GA, aka Georgia, just like me. Candle has a passion to help people get into real estate. It is her purpose to educate others on how to own it, sell it, and invest in it. For over seven years, Candle has been a real estate consultant, licensed associate real estate broker with Keller Williams Realty Cityside, and a host of her own podcast, Lighting Up Real Estate. She is here today to talk to us about how you as realtors can get licensed and leverage real estate to build more wealth. Hey, Candle, how you doing, girl? Welcome to the hey, show. I am so happy to be here. I am. Let's just talk, girl. Let's get this started. Yes, <laughs> it I is love good to it. see you again. And <laughs> you have been on my podcast. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so this invite is long overdue. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my podcast. Yes. Um, Candle, before we hop into the passion that we both share about real estate, yes. I want to kind of take it back a bit. You okay. know, I have two signature questions I ask guests now. And the first one is, what was money like for you when you were growing up? <sighs> T.D. Jakes yeah, would say take this. I had to just breathe for a second. He says something about... Uh, he used the term, I love T.D. Jakes. He says, sometimes you do things that are kind of schizophrenic, like you will see one thing, but you're doing something else. Because growing up, my mother would always tell me, my brother, we ain't broke. Money don't grow on trees. But yet, here, go take this rent receipt and go collect the rent from the tenant. It wasn't making sense. <laughs> so we never really understood what money was about because we were always believing we didn't have money. Money didn't grow on those trees. We never had anything. We couldn't afford to get the Happy Meal. We had to get two hamburgers and split the french fries from McDonald's. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was confusing. So we always mm -hmm. had a fear of money. I, I'm finally now approaching money a healthy way instead of thinking as soon as I spend or pay a bill, no money is going to be coming back in because my mom would always say, money's always going out. Money's always going out. Ain't no money coming in. But I just collected the rent. Something's not making sense. So now, much better, much better. But growing up, it was confusing, very confusing because we lived in a very beautiful, nice neighborhood, huge house out in the suburbs where we were the minorities. But my parents would say we didn't have money. So, you know, I could tell the stories on and on and on. But yeah, and to this day, my mother will still say we broke. But <laughs> she has a very nice portfolio. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this possibility that in her mind, she was like, this ain't your money, but this is my money. And <laughs> we're going to keep it moving. But I guess in her mind, she thought that was the better way to do it. So you would have a sense of. I don't know, valuing the money. Who knows? Like we yeah. never really understand some of the things that our parents do and why they do it. And it could very well be based on what they were taught as well. Right. That's exactly but what it is. But you did pick up, <laughs> you did pick up the seed though, that real estate is where it's at. So tell me, how did you get into investing in real estate? And what was your first aha moment? Like I need to be doing this. Oh, wow. I have two stories. Well, the first, I'll be quick with this one. I was in my early 20s, just graduated from college, and I got this phone call. And it was like, hey, Kendall, you're in Atlanta. I'm about to buy all these investment properties with my cousin that's a realtor, and I want you to get a property, too. I said, okay. And like, yeah, you just need a credit score. I can't remember what it was then, but it wasn't even a lot. But Truth be told, my name is Candle and I contributed in the 2008 great market housing crash <laughs> because I was buying those properties young and dumb. I had to be maybe 21, 22, had no idea what I was doing. 
going to those closings with no money whatsoever, but just my ID. And they were giving me all of these properties. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, and I was just going around bragging, telling people like, yeah, I got eight properties. And and they were looking like, what? Girl, put me on. I was putting everybody else on to the same realtor. We were buying up all of these properties. I remember telling my parents, my mom was just like, girl, you are crazy. Do you know what you've gotten yourself into? And I was just so proud that when I started to see changes in the market and the crash was starting to happen, I, I didn't know how to tell my parents I really messed up. Like, I really messed up and I don't know what to do. So I truly just said, OK, this is a learning experience. I'm young. I can come back later. What can I get out of this? Because truly I was incapable and even mature enough to handle this portfolio, to handle what was happening with the crash because it was inevitable. And uh, that's what really made me get back into the real estate realm now, learning from those lessons, because I was like in real time remembering when I had received the phone call from Countrywide. You know, that was one of the largest mortgage companies to go under Mm -hmm. and anybody associated with them lost it. They called me and they were like, yeah, I remember I was at a carnival girl. They were like, "Um, by the way, you have an outstanding balance of one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and we need our money immediately. I almost lost it. Like what? (laughs) Who does this? And I didn't know what to do, who to talk to. It was just like I couldn't call my parents. And I was just like, well, that house is just going to have to go because I can't do anything about it. It's done. And there's no way I can find this money this fast to keep this property. So from then on, it was just like, okay, let me just stack my paper. Let me just start learning. Let me do what I need to do to put myself back into this position to invest in real estate. And then one of the big moves I made, I moved out of the country to Abu Dhabi to teach. And that was a goal. I was going to stack all of this money I was going to make, tax-free dollars, and come back and start getting my properties and building my portfolio again. Well, me and God were on the same page. He's like, I want to do it in a different type of way. So, you know, he, we never understand his plan. We just say, okay, God, I trust you. And I got a call that my dad had been diagnosed with cancer. And so I came back to the States. And around that time, I thank God for this opportunity. I, you know, I, I miss my dad tremendously. He, tre- he taught me so much. It was literally the rich dad, poor dad experience. Because I was in this panic mode. I got to go to work. I got to go to work. I got to go to work. My dad would say, Kendall, you know what to do. Go around to all the properties and collect the rent money. And that'll pay your bills. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is actually paying all of my liabilities. This is financial freedom. So just from learning from my dad, and he was literally meeting me, um, having meetings with me and his financial advisor on everything, how to do everything. I just had the experience of, okay, I really get to stay home with my dad. My bills are paid and this is my freedom to do whatever I want to do. And at the exact same time, I had a friend that was losing her mother. No, her was a grandmother to Alzheimer's. And she was crying because she had to go to work every single day. And I'm like, if I could just tell her what my dad is teaching me or she just had maybe a property or two, she could leverage that financial freedom that she would have from the properties to be with her grandmother like I'm with my dad. So after my dad passed away, I was like, okay, let me continue growing this portfolio. So if something else happens to another family member, I don't have to feel like I got to be a slave to work. And I got my real estate license. And then that time I fell in love with real estate. It was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Everything made sense. And the, uh, my license instructor was like, Candy, you know, you're going to be teaching real estate to others. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to keep this portfolio that you know we've got and grow it. <laughs> and here we are to this day. Like, you know, now I'm teaching others and it's just my passion. It's my purpose. And I tell people all the time, like, yeah, I might be good, but I want you to be greater. I want you to take this and run with this because I'm here happy in this place that I am. But there is no limits to real estate. That's true. That's absolutely true. So I, that's so interesting. So I want to kind of go back though. In the crisis, you were able to write off, write, get get all this money, get all these houses. Did you lose all of the properties you had at that time (laughs) or just a couple? That's a great question. From what I remember, because it was, it feels like it was yesterday and it was a movie because it was so crazy. I want to say I lost. It was. Yeah. I want to say I lost two. And I remember I was, I was joking about it yesterday to another investor about that crash. And I think one of the closings, I was able to get, I unloaded all of my entire portfolio. One of the closings I was able to sell, uh, I think the rest of them. And I remember one closing, I walked away with $35. That's the most I got out of that crash when I had to just really wow. sell. My, yeah, <laughs> the portfolio was gone and I got $35. <laughs> So that's how serious that crash was. But I mean, it was so many stories. And it's like, you know what? I'm not the only one. It's going to be okay. 
And, you know, and I made it. It was the biggest lesson. And I tell people now, had it not been for that crash, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Educating others, because it was so many lessons I learned from that crash. Yeah. No, that's so good. And I always try to tell people it's even in the lessons that we learn and yeah. that encourages us to keep going. Like I tell people all the time, my first out of state rental, it was a good experience until it wasn't. Yeah. Um, and I didn't get into real estate investing to evict people, but I was facing an eviction mm. and did evict the first tenant and then was about to have to evict the second tenant. And I said, Lord, help me because I, this is not what I came into this to do. Exactly. And I really wanted to help people, especially if they were like, I want to buy the house. I love the house. You want to support them. You're like, yeah, I'm going to sell you the house. And then you're mm -hmm. like, wait, but you you just missed your rent. Like, how are you going to buy a house you can't pay the rent? Exactly. <laughs> so I, I tell my dad, who got me inspired to get into real estate, that, you know, it, it took a lot out of me to want to even stay in this space because yeah. I felt defeated. I felt like I went into this rental with enthusiasm and it was making money and it was just such a good deal. And then it wasn't, right? Yeah. But then we still were able to flip into another investor and get our money out. So I feel like that's what encouraged me to keep looking for other ways to invest in real mm -hmm. estate and finding my sweet spot. So like now I tell people, you know, I'm not really into rentals as much as before. I still have one, but I prefer commercial real estate like hotels and apartment syndications because yeah. that's where I don't have to do as much day to day. And the profit structure is different, but it's still real estate, right? You're still in a real estate space. Exactly. So I love how you, you know, you didn't get discouraged. You definitely was like, this is a movie. It was, right? The big short is actually a hilarious depiction of what really happened. Girl, I was looking at it yesterday but, morning. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> That movie is hilarious. And I love how they have the little cameos and they like the yes. definition of what's happening. Um, but yeah, but Kendall, I love that. And I love your transparency because at the end of the day, you decided to flip the script and turn your experience into an academy. So yeah. tell me a little bit more about Candle Real Estate Academy and what you offer, you know, as a realtor yourself, what exactly are you teaching other realtors inside this space? Oh, that's a great question. Well, Candle Real Estate Academy was a seed plant that was planted because I have a background in education, but I no longer wanted to teach kindergarten students. Shout out to my babies. I love y'all, but that really wasn't my calling. When I got into that pre-licensure class, I really started teaching my own classmates like, oh, this is how we're going to do this. And this I was explaining terms. I created my own study groups. And the teacher was like, Kendall, you're going to have your own school. I'm like, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. I mean, we're going back and forth about it. She's like, I won't even we can partner together. I'm like, I'm not going to have a school. And God literally just said, I don't care how good you are in this real estate world selling you're going to teach this school. So he really had to pivot me and somehow punish me until I literally said, OK, God, I'll answer this calling. Let's do this. And so I uh, I took I, you know, I, I hired a consultant to show me how to create the school. But the need was one. I still had the passion to educate others, just period, about the things that I know. I didn't take it lightly that I was fortunate enough to be able to have that financial freedom while my dad was sick. And when I got into the real estate sales world, Yes, the money is amazing, but yet I still saw other realtors that didn't have investment properties, that didn't even own their own home. And it's like, let's have this conversation. How in the world do we have access to hundreds to thousands of active properties on the market? It's something like cheap, and we're not trying to buy them ourselves. We're trying to help our other investors get you know into the game. And I remember the one lesson that hit me was I worked with this amazing investor, and he flipped a property. And when I saw what he got at closing compared to what I got at closing, it was like, OK, God, I'm hearing you. I hear what you're saying. We're going to get back into investing and then we're going to help others because it just didn't make sense. Like, how are we not talking about this? Why are we not sharing this? Because when I looked at the stats, mm -hmm. only 37 percent of realtors have a second property for income producing cash flow. And I'm like, what? Every day we're in this MLS and we don't own like this should be the opposite. It should be 85 percent to 90 should be because that was one of the things that I loved about Keller Williams was their mindset or their principles was that we are into we're into selling real estate to own our own portfolio. And that's why I joined it, because that was the intention. However, that's not what we see. 
Yeah, so making that a reality for other people is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so many realtors do not own passive prop passive income generating properties? Like you're right, you have access to the resources, you know what the numbers are. Is it a cash flow issue? That's a great question. I think it's not a cat. I think it's more so the exposure because, yes, Keller Williams did say the principle was we were in this to become our own investors and have our own portfolio. But there was no education. So that had me going out to seek everybody I could find, taking every course I could to learn it the right way. You know, and then I just said, OK, let me just start finding other authors to become my teachers. That's when I found Robert Kiyosaki. And I really sat down and, and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then I moved to other books. I read Tony Robbins. Then I read like so many books on real estate investing. I started listening to Bigger Pockets while I was on my way to showings just to get an idea like, OK, the intention is I've got to become an investor. And I remember this one class that I found. Um, it was a CE course and I paid a lot of money for it. And it was that seed that was planted. And it was about real estate investing. In my mind, I'm thinking, OK, Ken, if you're taking this class for real estate investing, you're going to become a real estate investor. And it was OK. Mm -hmm. I knew a little bit more than what they taught, but it planted that seed that I can do this. So probably within maybe three mm -hmm. months, I saved up all of my commission checks and I got my first flip. And then I turned that flip into a buy and hold because I was like, no, nah, this property's too good. Let's start building this portfolio back up. And that's what I did. But it's just the intention of one, I think the lack of education for realtors in in the aspect of investing. Mm -hmm. The classes that are available for CE are also like, you know, how to market to get more leads, you know, different ways to get um, buyers, you know, how to become that amazing listing agent or the listing agent challenge. And I'm like, I'm not seeing any CE courses about investing because the market is changing. I talk to real estate agents all the time and they're saying like, yeah, you know, back when we had our our interest rates at two, three percent, girl, I was banking. I had about 30 closings and now I just did four. And it's like, well, if you had a property while you were making everybody else rich, getting these two, three percent, you kind of invest in property with a conventional loan with that same percent and you would be making so much money right now. But we can't have that conversation. So now let's start having the conversation now and where we are. And get over the two, three percent. That's never going to happen again in our lifetime. But we can get a property because somebody's willing to pay rent and that rent is going to pay that mortgage. That's that six to seven percent. And you can still get a cash flow. That is so true. I definitely feel like it's important to acknowledge the fact that housing is an essential good, right? Yes. Everyone needs a place to live. They need a safe place to be and they want to be comfortable. And some people don't want to own for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, it could be their credit score. It could be they don't want to have the responsibility of owning a home because, you know, we have to fix stuff when we right. own it. But I definitely feel like rentals are a great way to have that continuous passive income. And that what you're saying is that comfort, even when the market's down and people are buying less houses, because mm -hmm. if you have the rental income, that's going to be steady. And then your commissions from selling homes is going to be the bonus, right? So right. what do you recommend for someone, anyone, not just realtors, but anyone who wants to get started in real estate? What are the first three things you recommend they do? Oh, wow. There's so many ways you can get started in this realm. I recommend one, deciding on what exactly is going to give you financial freedom. And we've got to take the baby steps to get there. So you can just go backwards and just say, okay, I'm going to write out every single bill that I have and how much I pay every single month. If I could just get that first property to pay my car note, that's making a big change in how much money I can save per month because I have now a tenant that is now giving me the cash flow that I need to take care of a bill. Then you can find another property and say, OK, well, the next bill I have is, you know, I might have uh, student loans that I have. I would love to have a property, take this load off of me and start paying my student loan payments every single month. Then just find another property. And this is how we build our portfolio. That is one way we can you, you can do it. Another way can, you can do it is just simply decide that, hey, I just want to become a real estate investor. I really am interested in being an Airbnb hostess. I love the fact of the hospitality range, being able to do customer service hands on with my guests. And I have I want to get a house and decorate it because I have a gift for decorating and I have a, a knack for the hospitality area. Let's just get an Airbnb. So most people just go to where they feel their calling or passion is. I have some, and I'm one of these people, I have a heart for people that need affordable housing right now. So mm -hmm. I tell people, if you have a need, because it's a lot of women, oh my gosh, it's so many women with families that are homeless 
But if you have a passion and you want to serve that purpose, then get a home and make it for affordable housing. And you're solving a big problem right now because when that crash happened, well, not the crash, back in 2000. Um, 19, 20, well, 20, 21, 22, with those two to three percent rates, a lot of these investors saw the opportunity, which they should have. And they, of course, unloaded their part, their portfolio and made millions of dollars. But then the people that were in those houses, they got put out. And of course, they were not able to even compete with people that decided that they wanted to sell their home as opposed to rent out their home the way they used to for affordable housing. And then you also have the landlords that say, well, I could do affordable housing for my four bedroom and get, you know, $1,200 a month. But it's also a market because people that couldn't get in that two to 3%, you know, range when they were buying, they're willing to rent the same house for $1,500 a month. So I think I'm gonna go with the $1,500 a month as opposed to affordable housing. And this is why they keep getting pushed to the side and ignored. Hmm. That's so sad, but that yeah. happens. And you sound just like me, because when I got in, I was like, I want to provide safe, affordable housing for people of color. Girl, it's yeah. a struggle sometimes. Yeah. So it just depends on where you decide to invest. And I think um, you have to just be flexible because mm-hmm. the market's going to change. The circumstances are going to change. But the fact that real estate appreciates is valuable and a great yes. way to make passive income has been consistent for decades. So I love the fact that you are leveraging that to encourage individuals to have that freedom. And the truth is, um, the more passive income you make while you're alive, Mm -hmm. the easier it is for you to do the free stuff you want to do or the fun stuff you want to do because your bills are paid. So just to recap, guys, you know, we talked about trying to replace just one bill and then eventually replacing them all through real estate and then using your license as a realtor to also build your portfolio. Because you alluded to this, but I just want to be clear. As a realtor, when you're closing on your own deals, are you still paid at the closing table? Yes, you are. You can still get paid at the closing (laughs) table. And many brokerages, they allow you not to, excuse me, they allow you not to even pay any fees to them. So you get 100% of your commission oh, wow. when you buy your own investment property. And that is one thing I can say about Keller Williams. They said that if we're about you know building our own portfolio as realtors, they allow us to have 100% commission when we close on our own deals. So yes. I love that. So that's more encouragement to close oh, yeah. your own deals. Oh right? yeah, Making most definitely. I love that. And then you can also help others become homeowners and investors grow their portfolios too. Do you recommend if I become a realtor, I get licensed, should I have a niche? Should I focus on Mm. a particular customer like only investors or like only first time homeowners? What's your recommendation? I definitely recommend a niche because that is your strong point, because when you have a niche, it allows you when you are making your marketing, you are targeting people like, oh, that person's speaking to me. I want to work with them. But if you're just like, hey, just I buy, sell and invest in real estate. Y'all like everybody says that that's the basic (laughs) tagline for every realtor. But just be more direct. Like I can tell you about this brand new program that's coming out for first time home buyers where you're not paying 100 percent. You you know, you're not you're getting 100 percent financing and plus, you know, closing assistance. Then you're targeting somebody. That's a first time home buyer. If you said, Mm -hmm. if you are thinking of moving to Atlanta, Georgia, I have this amazing package available, then you're targeting people that are outside of Atlanta, Georgia. So that is your niche because you're just broad. You know, you're just, they're just not going to, you're not really reaching out to anybody. That's just the basic tagline. Mm -hmm. So you do need to have Mm -hmm. a niche. And I tell people all the time, well, real estate agents all the time, like if you just find what you're passionate about or just, or maybe if you can't even realize what your passion is, just look at your previous closings. Like, are they with first time buyers? Are they relocating? Is it a spear that you're targeting? Who are these people? Are you looking out for people that might be in um, your church? Then that's going to be your spear. You want to market to them. You might want to hold events within your church or sponsor events that are happening in the church. That is going to be who your, you know, your people are. And there's nothing wrong with that. I started out doing my alma mater because I saw so many of my classmates not owning. I said, wait a minute. I'm a product of Fort Valley State University. I said, okay, this wildcat's not, you know, owning. That wildcat's not owning. So I reached out to every wildcat intentionally, but I didn't take it lightly. I created scholarships for my alma mater too to let them know, like, hey, we're going to give back because the friendship was created at this school. So I started giving money back to the school after every closing. But that was my spear and that was my niche. 
I wanted intentionally this family from my alma mater to start becoming homeowners or, you know, or helping them sell their properties as well. And that's what I did. I love that. That's such a good idea. So going back to your networks Mm -hmm. and creating a purpose within that space. And I love the fact that you said, look, we're graduates from college and we're not only we need to change that. And then going that extra step to create a scholarship, give money back to your alma mater is sowing back into the community. And I love that you made so many gems, so many gems. Oh, if I you. was a realtor, <laughs> I would probably adopt 99% of those ideas right now. Oh, I got tons <laughs> of them. I share so them all the time. You got tons yeah. in, in the academy. Yeah, in the academy. So guys, this, is, this, <laughs> this has been really good. So another signature question that mm-hmm. I ask every guest on the show is what is your purpose for money? Oh, girl, it was something that struck out with me. I don't think I have it on my desk. I wrote it down. I was listening to um, who was that? I'm not going to misquote it. It was the Breakfast Club and they had. Oh, gosh, who was that? I could see his face. He's a commentator, a black commentator. And he made this comment about I can make money like a capitalist, but give it away like a socialist. And I'm like, that struck a nerve with me. I was like, oh, that's me. Because I'm big on being a capitalist. I'm not ashamed of it. I tell people all the time, if you're going to, you know, and become an investor, you are a capitalist. There's nothing wrong with that. But who's to say that you can't turn around and create scholarships or give money to churches or create your own foundation and do whatever you want to do with the money that you've made? There's nothing wrong with it because we have a lot of guilt on us as investors. And I'm pretty sure you understand. (laughs) And it's yeah. just, you know, and yeah. my purpose is, you know, I want to use the gifts God's given me. Like we we both have these amazing gifts and talents for creating wealth through real estate. And there is nothing wrong with that. That's in the Bible. You know, that's his plan for us. And I'm not any any yeah. I'm not going to feel guilty about that anymore. But if my intentions are with money that I can also have the right to give it away how I want to and see fit. That's okay too. I'm giving myself permission to do that. So that's what my purpose with money is just to use it how God has it. <laughs> has planted in me to give without <laughs> any regrets, you know. <laughs> Yes. No, that's beautiful. I think Thank that's you. definitely one of the most thoughtful responses to that question. And I love how you phrase it because these are gifts, right? Every mm-hmm. single closing dividend yeah. check, um, passive monthly income check. I'm like, yes, thank you, Jesus. But I definitely yeah. agree with you that we can be just as giving. And I think it's important to have a plan. Like for me as a mm-hmm. business owner, I actually have in my plan that 10% of my business revenue is tied in. I've been doing that nice. for a few years now and it's my motivation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I used to wait till the end of the year, look at every all the total revenue because mm-hmm. I tied off the gross. And then I would would um, give in January, but recently, as I implement the profit first strategy in my business, isn't that the I game have been changer? Taking ten percent, yes, it's a game changer, girl. girl. <laughs> Every time the money come in, I'm like, oh, here go my percentages, ten percent for Jesus, girl. and I just. Um, I have QuickBooks where it allows me to have these envelopes. So I have my tied envelope and oh, nice. I'm just like, I have a goal. And so the <laughs> goal is on the envelope, but, and I just keep adding to it and I'm like, oh, okay, just a couple more thousand here. And I'm going <laughs> to reach milestone number two. And so mm-hmm. I'm like super charged and excited about giving, but I definitely, that's my motivation. People think the motivation is me, but the motivation is he, like, yeah. I just oh, want to give my, just, you know, so much of what he's given to me back and put it into my church. And and ironically enough, I'm sharing more than I have ever Keep shared about going. this. this but is I'm so good. also hiding it into my church's building fund. So we have a fund to win the city of Washington, D.C., and we're using this fund to acquire more properties in the area to create more churches mm-hmm. in the area. And so my sewing into my church is specifically sewing into our growth that's specifically Love. growing our real estate portfolio um, of churches. Mm-hmm. So that is wow. That is the first time I've ever shared that. Um, but that is true. And that's what I'm choosing to do Love. as a CEO. And that's my business. And then I tied, you know, my household income with my husband as well, because that's our 
you know, right. contribution to God and returning to him what he's done in our household. But it's mm-hmm. it's really important to me as a business owner to tie business revenue. I so love that. um I love that. Yes, Candle, this was so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being a guest on the Purpose of Money podcast. Um, so are those who are listening and they want to join the Candle Real Estate Academy, they want to follow you on social, they want to know where are you, please <laughs> drop all the handles tags right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can follow me, of course, at everything I'm, I'm on. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn at Candle Locket. At every hook is Candle Locket. Yeah. If you want to take a class, which I, I would love for you to do, I teach live courses and I also have live instructors as well. And for realtors and for those that even want to become realtors, we also teach live pre-licensure courses. And we have also added on to those pre-licensure courses for the state of Georgia. I will be also offering a live cram course because we are making sure that you are we, we take your time seriously. If you're taking these classes to become an agent, you will become an agent. We're offering everything we can. So you get the free cram course with me and I will be teaching that live. And we will be working with you until you pass that test, because this is serious. Like we really want you to get into the industry of real estate. And um, yeah, you can pretty much find me in those places, Candle Real Estate Academy and on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. I love it. Don't worry, guys. I will leave all of those links in the show notes so you can click follow and subscribe. And I will definitely ask that if you like this episode, if you think there's someone out there who would benefit from hearing it so they can get into real estate, become a realtor and start to leverage real estate to build their money, please share this episode right now. I hope that you guys got so many gems out of this because I even learned quite a bit for myself and I really appreciated having you on the show, Candle. Thank you so much for being here. It was an honor. Guys, until next time, you're welcome. (laughs) Guys, until next time, keep building generational wealth. Bye-bye.